So what this is uh, this this is uh, I was saying one of my favorite New Scientist uh, magazine. Um, many of you will know the New Scientist, popular science magazine, and um, I show it because it just reminds us how extraordinary is the science and the technology that we've seen coming through, certainly in my professional lifetime. And everything I'm going to be talking about is prefaced by the fact that we're not we're not sort of saying something that's anti the science or against the science or even limiting the science. It's very much complementary to the science. And um, I'd like us in a sense to have this as the backdrop to the whole presentation, because although I won't be talking neuroscience or any other kind of science very much, I will be talking about something that, as you'll see by the end of the presentation, we need more of rather than less of, not because somehow science is getting it all wrong, but because science is getting it wonderfully right, but we need to be able to use the science appropriately. Um, one of the people who uh, actually from the other place, Cambridge, um, Stephen Hawking sadly died recently, but you'll all be familiar with him as a very talented theoretical physicist. He had the Lucasian chair in Cambridge, which was the first uh, Lucasian professor was Isaac Newton. And um, Stephen Hawking, said that with the advances in philosophy in in science philosophy is now dead well that's certainly not been the case with philosophy and psychiatry ian you mentioned the growth of the field in recent years this is a few of the things that have been going on um it's slightly out of date this list there's more than 43 groups now but you can see we've got a very international and strong international development with new professorial chairs in many parts of the world many parts of the world um and new training program. The latest training program is the MetaMasters I mentioned um, earlier, which we were talking about with a faculty meeting earlier today. We're hoping to launch towards the end of the month. So there's lots going on. Values-based practice that we're going to come back to is a very much a sort of philosophy into practice development. Um, you can learn about values-based practice without learning any philosophy, just as you can learn to prescribe a medication without knowing the pharmacology behind it. Um, but it probably helps to know a bit of the theory. Um, we've had a number of postdocs now in philosophy of psychiatry in Oxford. Uh, Ian mentioned the book series, which is a series of books and handbooks with well over 50 volumes now. Um, this is the branding of the International Perspective series. Uh, this is the handbook. There's also a textbook of philosophy and psychiatry um, and um, many other volumes in that series. Eric Matthews, by the way, had a couple of very good volumes in the series, which have, have done really well. We've had a number of summer schools in Oxford and other parts of the world. Uh, we've most recently had a tutorial post dedicated to philosophy of mind and psychiatry. Uh, you'll see that's called the Fulford Clarendon Fellowship, which is at the St. Catherine's College where I am. But the um, post holder, is not me. It's uh, a chap called Philip Corollas who works in semantic logic. And I think it's an indication of the maturity of the field that we should have people working in these very abstract areas of philosophy. He works as a philosopher with cognitive neuroscientists. And we should have people working in such abstract areas of philosophy, really very much at the cutting edge of research in the field. So philosophy may well be dead in Cambridge but it's certainly not in Oxford is the starting point of this presentation. Now, we might do an exercise here, but we won't, which is about what people understand by philosophy. And I suspect if we did this exercise, we'd find that, uh, I guess we've got sort of 20 or 30 people in the room, we'd all come up with very different ideas about it. I'm gonna focus on a particular area of philosophy. It's a, a, a part of Oxford analytic philosophy, and you can see it's associated with this chap J.L. Austin. And Austin was the White's professor of moral philosophy in Oxford in the 50s, at a time when moral philosophy was very much taken up with abstract issues around the logic of values. And it's that work that Austin did in what's now become known as ordinary language philosophy that has driven the development of values-based practice. Ordinary language philosophy is really what it says on the tin. It's a way of looking at the use of, the ordinary use of language as a guide to the way we understand the concepts that sit behind our use of language. 
And Austin used the phrase in one place about this ordinary language philosophy as being a kind of philosophical fieldwork, which is important because it's one of the many ways in which ordinary language philosophy, although not particularly high profile among philosophers, is helpful to us in practical areas like psychiatry because ordinary language philosophy connects naturally with empirical methods of research. It's not a panacea. What it does is to give us a more complete view of what another Oxford philosopher, Gilbert Ryle, called the logical geography. So it's a way of enlarging our view, getting more of the peripheral field into our view when we're thinking about the meaning of concepts. And we'll see why that's important later on in the presentation. So philosophical fieldwork, what does that mean? Well, Austin worked on legal cases, but interestingly, in his most explicitly methodological paper on this work, he, say, he finishes the paper by saying, I've been through these rather dry legal cases, but actually a really rich area for philosophers to work in, remember this is in the 1950s, a really rich area for philosophers to work in is abnormal psychology and psychiatry. If only we philosophers could get our hands on some case material. So Austin, I think, anticipated where we've been going with the philosophy psychiatry movement, certainly in the UK, uh, and it's grown probably even faster among philosophers than it has among psychiatrists. And one of the reasons is because of the philosophical richness of the material we can bring to bear. So in the rest of this outline, this presentation, we're going to look um, at uh, the story of Simon as a case study. And we're going to start with very much an ordinary language foundation for that by thinking about Simon as a patient of our, of our own. I think, um, is everybody in the room a, a psychiatrist? Do we have any non-psychiatrists? I think most are psychiatrists. I don't know everyone. Uh, so I'll come to this in a bit more detail in a moment, but um, the point to make is that although this we'll be looking at this later on through the lens of ordinary language philosophy, Simon is a real person. His story is disguised, but he's a real person. And he's somebody that we might meet as a psychiatrist or somebody we might meet as just a relative or friend. And we'll be wanting to think about him as a real person, which indeed he is, uh, as a real person and someone that if he was our patient, we'd be having to decide how to help him. So it'll be st starting from a real story. Um, and then in this, when we've had a look at Simon and dug a bit into what his story means for us, I'll be outlining rather more briefly these different aspects of, um, of the way that Simon's story takes us from philosophy into practice, uh, particularly picking up on the theme of values-based practice. And then I'm going to try and leave a few minutes at the end for some conclusions, because the, the conclusions, and again, we owe this to Austin, as you'll see, but the conclusions are very much around mental health being first in the field with an important development, rather than, as it has so often in the 20th century, being portrayed as trailing behind the rest of medicine. It's a mental health first story. So Simon's story. Now, um, Ian, here, um, I, I, I think we've circulated the story, but I'm wondering if it would be helpful if I reprised. Yes, please. Story yeah. briefly. So yeah, reprise would be good. Yeah. I'm going to read Simon's story. And then what I'd like everybody to do, some of you will have read the story and some not. You'll see we had a question at the bottom saying, please write a differential diagnosis if you're a professional, clinical professional. If you're not, imagine that Simon is a relative and think what you would feel is going on. Now, I know we have one or two non-psychiatrists in the room, and I want to emphasize that um, you're as likely to get this right, as a, in my experience, as a non-psychiatrist as you are as a psychiatrist. I do use it as a teaching case for psychiatrists, but I'm not teaching philosophy. Uh, it is a real story, but don't feel inhibited by any supposed lack of knowledge. It's a common sense reaction. And for psychiatrists, they have to add to the common sense their professional knowledge. But it's thinking of it not as a philosophical case study. You'll see it's quite an ordinary study in psychiatric terms, quite an ordinary story. Um, but thinking of it as a, a real person where we're thinking it 
thinking about Simon as somebody we would be wanting to help, either as a professional or as a friend or relative. So Simon. Simon was in his 40s, a senior black American professional from a middle class Baptist family. He'd had a rather successful career, but this was now threatened by legal action from some of his colleagues. Simon claimed to be completely innocent of the charges, but mounting a defense was going to be both expensive and hazardous. He, he was in the Southern states. His response to this crisis was unusual for him. He responded by praying at a small altar, which he set up in his uh, front room at home. What he did was he went home and opened a box in which th there was the family Bible, uh, got the family Bible out, put it on a table, put a couple of candles either side of it, and then he, uh, he knelt down and spent the whole evening and much of the night praying and outpouring about his problems. Now, when he got to his feet in the morning, he found that the candles had burnt down and the wax had flowed onto the Bible and had marked certain words and phrases. He called these marks seals or sons, and they, the wax went through into several pages cover, and, and marking out certain words and phrases. Now, this is then a quote from Simon, because what Simon does is he gets the phone and he rings a friend and he, he says, I got up and I saw the seal that was in my father's Bible and I called my friend X and I said, you know, something remarkable is going on over here. I think the beauty of it was the specificity by which the sun burned through. It was in my mind a clever play on words. Now, other people have seen these marked words and phrases, and they had no explicit meaning for anybody other than Simon. But for Simon, they showed that he, he, he interpreted them as a direct communication from God, which showed that he had a special purpose or mission. And then in his words, I am the living son of David, and I'm also a relative of Ishmael and of Joseph. I am the captain of the guard of Israel. Now, other people were unconvinced by Simon's account of what had gone on, but he it didn't shake his conviction at all. He said, the truths that are up in that room are the truths that have been spoken of for 4,000 years. And I don't get upset when I'm confronted with skepticism. I don't get upset because I know within myself what I know. Now, Ian, I'm going to suggest that we might ask people to put into the chat yes. some suggestions about what they think is happening with Simon. Yes, please. Yeah. So people can do that. Yeah. I'm not sure I can access the chat from here without. Um, yeah, I, I, I can see it. So I can uh, read it out. If you, you can perhaps give me a few of the. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so this is the first, this is the question, okay. essentially. We've, we've, we've got one, um, Peter Benny's wondering, maybe a manic episode. Um, um, Alex McLean, an acute stress reaction. Um, yeah. Paranoid psychosis. Uh, delusional disorder, as sort of differential, because you, you know, we would be wanting to know about his his mood state. I mean, for for me also, it's it's a classic description of a, a primary delusion. This is straight out of uh, Schneider, or <laughs> I, I can't I can't think of it, or ever seen uh, uh, had a case where where I've identified a primary delusion. Or no, it tends to get mopped up with neuroleptics rather quickly, doesn't it? <laughs> Um, any, other, any other suggestions? We're getting quite a good list already. Yeah, uh, acute transients. So we, we're we're going through the the diagnostic sieve, and you know we we'd be wanting more information. 
Yes, uh, uh, there will be more information in a few minutes, but on the information we've got, what are the possibilities? There's an important area that we're missing as psychiatrists. Yeah. Um... Remember, this is a man in his 40s who's had no, uh, little more information, he's, he's, he's had no significant episodes like this in the past. Yes. And he is under in a stressful situation. But... Brain tumor is mentioned. Yeah. Um... Say again? A tremor of the brain. Something yes, like well, that. organic causes in general. Um, yes. So, it could, and, and if it was a brain tumor, what part of the brain would it be affecting, do you think? Temporal lobe, yeah. Yeah, temporal lobe or, or, or deep in the diencephalon. And the importance of that is that you might pick up a temporal lobe lesion on a brain scan, but you wouldn't necessarily pick up a deep lesion. So it's definitely got to be on the list. Yeah. Of and, and the other thing is that, it, it, there was some nice work done at the um, Institute of Psychiatry many years ago showing that brain tumours presenting psychiatrically very often had a history of stress at onset. Yes. And you can see that the stress, A, it might just be a retrospective explanation of what's happened, and but it could also be that the stress has raised the blood patient's blood pressure and they've had a bleed into the tumour. So you can't just say, well, there's a clear stress stressor here yeah, that doesn't yeah. preclude that doesn't exclude organic yeah. lesions i think i think as the fact it comes from that kind of bible belt culture um so you, you also have to think about it in cultural terms. yes no that that's that that's you do need to think about the cultural so as you've raised that um in the, the the issue with the culture is that he did come from a baptist background and of course, he had he he he'd not been a practicing Baptist for many years, but he did have that whole culture in his background. Yeah, yeah. But his peers who were practicing in that field and did the sort of speaking with tongues and so on, um, yeah. they all thought this was way off the wall. They they didn't think it was they didn't think it was spiritual at all. Um, so he was an N of one, as we say. He he was on his own on this one. Yeah. So it's, it's it's not it's not a culturally sanctioned reaction. Yeah. Um, David, David but, but we should certainly be thinking of that, undoubtedly. No diagnosis uh, from David. <laughs> so what do you mean by no diagnosis? That no, no no illness. David. Is that right? David. Yes, I suppose I'm just sort of throwing it in there as a thought. Um, I suppose we'd need, we'd need to know a lot more, wouldn't we, about his background in order to be sure about that, but well, it, it's just what, worth what, holding what in mind. Need, what would you need to know about his background? I, I suppose one of the things that you might consider is about, whether, is about the harmfulness or, the, or, the, or how, um, yes. how, how dis, dysfunctional this, yes. Um, yes. Yes. Very good. This, this state of affairs might be. Caused. How would that how would that affect your di differential diagnosis? I'm asking you for a reason, David, because you're onto the track of something we want to go down. So, <laughs> um, I mean, we've agreed. It, I, I, I'm going to agree with uh, Ian that he does have a primary delusion, as defined in the PSE. I'll show you the definition in a moment. Um, so he does have a primary delusion. Um, you're saying we need to look at his functioning. And we'll see you have authority for that, at least from the other side of the pond. Um, but what, what difference would it make in, in terms of your differential diagnosis if he's? Well, you, you might have you might have an uh, you might have a, a, a set of beliefs which aren't normative, but which aren't a, a source of disorder or dysfunction. Well, we uh, need to say which. Yeah, because... I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm sort of wading into deeper water here, aren't I? Well, but but, but entirely appropriately, um, and perhaps uh, I could take the story forward a little bit and show you why I'm leading you on in that deep water, because <laughs> we do need to look at that deep water for a very specific reason. And I'm carrying forward your word harmfulness, um, David, which you said the harmfulness of his condition and then you started talking about disorder and dysfunction so let's see how the, the story goes uh now what's happened right so 
this is um this is the this is, i did this list actually without getting your answers but you can see we've covered much of the same uh possibilities in fact remarkably the same possibilities um when i do this with groups of trainee psychiatrists they very much focus on psychosis and delusions they talk about schizophrenia um and with good reason because as ian's pointed out he does have a primary delusion this is delusional perception which is a specific form of primary delusion uh, and this is the definition from the present state examination which when i was training was the kind of gold standard of uh, how you did a mental state and a delusional perception is a delusion that is based on sensory experiences and involves suddenly becoming convinced that a particular set of events has a special meaning well that's simon to a t and people trained in the present state examination have assessed simon's story and they all they all say he has a delusional perception what does that mean well if we go to this is where i was starting to press you a bit uh, david if we go to the icd the world health organization classification um we have really no option but to say that simon has a psychotic illness of one kind or another the differential diagnosis then of course does become absolutely crucial because we're thinking about anything from uh, a, 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 a temporary reaction to stress through to a brain tumor really important that we dig into that but the icd doesn't include issues of dysfunction and harm in its definition of illness it's purely based on a syndrome a set of symptoms possibly a few signs thrown in but here's what happened to simon and this is the information David, that you were going after, I, I suspect. Simon, far from being unwell with this condition, he was empowered by it, but also guided. Now, we don't know to this day how this worked, but Simon was a lawyer. He was, I mentioned he was a professional person. He was actually a lawyer. And he took from these messages information about which law books to get from which shelves in which library in order to come up with the cases he needed to defend the action against him. And the bottom line was that he won his case, very difficult to do in the southern states of America as a black, he was a black lawyer. And his case was shown to be the, uh, a racially motivated attack on a black lawyer by his white peers and it was thrown out uh, simon's prestige as a lawyer of course then went through the roof and the last we heard from him he'd made a great deal of money and he was setting up a foundation not to study schizophrenia but to study your category essentially david spiritual experience if if i can count that as no diagnosis and so that seems to make the icd story look a bit odd doesn't it you know either icd is wrong or um simon the court was wrong right um but if we go to the other side of the pond and look at the dsm this is the latest dsm dsm5 um but we from dsm i think three onwards there's been included a whole second set of criteria so you have the symptom based criteria that we have in icd and then alongside it you have what are called criteria of clinical significance now these criteria weren't introduced to differentiate normal from or adaptive from maladaptive psychosis they were introduced to provide a criterion of severity that could be used in the insurance based uh, health system in the states but actually the criteria provide exactly what we need for understanding simon's story so here is the relevant criterion for schizophrenia now remember this is criterion b so we've already satisfied criterion a primary delusion delusional perception are absolutely at the middle of criterion a as they are in the uh, icd but in addition to criterion A, for a diagnosis of schizophrenia in DSM-5, you have to satisfy criterion B. 
and this is, I'll read the first part of this. Think about Simon as I read it. For a significant portion of the time since the onset of the disturbance, level of functioning in one or more major areas, such as work, interpersonal relations or self-care is markedly below the level achieved prior to the onset. Then the parenthesis is about children, which is a counterpart criterion, or when the onset is in childhood or adolescence, there is failure to achieve expected levels of interpersonal, academic, or occupational functioning. Now, as I've got David and Ian on screen, um, do you think Simon satisfies, from what I've, from the additional information I've given you, does Simon satisfy criterion B? No. <laughs> he doesn't, does he? I don't know in the, in the chat or anywhere if anybody disagrees with me. I mean, essentially, what I would argue, and I suspect most of us would agree, is that uh, we don't know about his functioning in interpersonal relations or self-care, but as far as his work is concerned, which is the information we've got, he won his court case, went on to become a very successful lawyer, and his level of functioning, if anything, was enhanced rather than diminished by his experiences. So, I think it would you'd be hard pushed to say that he satisfied criterion B. Are we getting any dissenting voices? I'm sorry I can't do this for real, but yeah, um, some people may be wondering if he would meet criteria for a different diagnosis, maybe conversion, psychosis in ICD-10. But I don't, I don't know if all the DSM categories would have that that kind of functional criteria. Yes, it does run through the whole classification. Yeah. Um, so it's a good it's a good point I, I think i was taking the two extremes so that on the one hand he quite clearly has criterion a symptoms of a severe psychotic illness be it schizophrenia manic disorder organic disorder or whatever but on the other hand he in in, in, in so far as the information goes that we've got he clearly doesn't satisfy criterion b and where that leads us to is that we could Whereas with ICD, we're obliged to say that Simon has a severe illness. We can say it's a severe illness, but he's lucky because it's not, he's, he's one of the ones who's got off lightly, but we're still calling it a severe illness. Whereas in DSM, we've at least got the conceptual space to say that he could have, this could be a, a normal or adaptive spiritual experience, which although it's taken the form of psychotic experiences is not a psychotic illness. Yeah, that, now, that, that, again, that. I, I, if we if, if we had a, a live audience, I'd be saying to you um, who, who's persuaded or not persuaded by this story, because in a sense, this is the heart of this is the heart of uh, the whole presentation this evening is what we make of Simon. Yeah, yeah, there, there's a few comments. Uh, Peter Benny, is it clear that Simon could not have found the legal books? without this, his, this spiritual experience, is there direct cause and effect here? Um, it's a good point. Um, I, I, I wouldn't like to speculate. No. Um, what I think we can say is that Simon attributed it to information he was getting from his experiences yeah. and that the end result was that he performed extremely well as a lawyer yeah. Uh, won his case and went on to establish a very successful career. Um, yeah. So if we take this criterion literally, we're looking at his level of functioning in his work yeah. and we're wanting to say it was enhanced rather than diminished. Yeah. But and it's a fair point. I, I wouldn't like to speculate on the causation. It remains a mystery to us. <laughs> and As I, I say, he's a real story. Gordon Barclay wondering what ICD or DSM would have made of St. Paul referring to not I, but the Christ in me. So. Ah, well, I guess there the issue would be, do we regard St. Paul as functioning better or worse after his conversion? Yes. <laughs> and yes. I suspect that will depend on which religion we're coming from. Yeah, but, so uh, definitely yeah. values, yeah. 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 At, least in, at least in terms of his effect, if we're measuring, um, in terms of that question, his effect on Western civilization, yes. I think it's got to have been pretty massive in those terms. Well, I, I, I could, is, is that is that Gordon speaking? Yes, that's Gordon. Yeah. Yes. No, Gordon, I, I yeah. couldn't agree with you more. And in fact, we've published stuff in the journal PPP around the differences and similarities between psychotic illness and 
and spiritual experiences. Um, and uh, I think William James published a lot on this as well. My mentor on this was Mike Jackson, who from whose study Simon's story comes. And yeah. uh, apparently William James talks about spiritual experience or psychosis being spiritual experience turned upside down. Uh, mm -hmm. It's exactly the same experience. What And this brings us to the nub, really. What matters is whether it, it, it does you good or harm. And yeah. David, you remember you said, I want to know about whether it was causing him any harm. And that's that's precisely the point here. And we can see that. Remember, I was I said to you, this is going to be an ordinary language inspired presentation largely, because if we look at the language of criterion B, I've highlighted here the values. So what criterion B is asking for is not just a change of functioning, but a change below the level achieved prior to the onset. And in children, there is failure to achieve the expected levels of interpersonal, academic, or occupational functioning. Now, this is to anybody but an American psychiatrist, because they hate this part of the presentation. This is very clear evidence that criterion B is about values. And actually, Gordon, your question about St. Paul makes the same point rather more vividly, because it, it, isn't, it, is, it, it isn't just a matter of sort of, you know, um, whether St. Paul was a good or a bad thing it does go to the heart of how we understand St. Paul's experiences. And it, it, DSM, at least, at least with this criterion, DSM at least gives us the space to say St. Paul wasn't suffering a primary delusion. He experienced a primary delusion in phenomenological terms, but it wasn't a symptom of an illness. It was actually part of his spiritual experience that proved to be adaptive rather than maladaptive. Um, I'm, I'm looking, uh, Ian, to see if you've got people disagreeing with me in the chat. Um, oh, no. Um, I, I think P Peter Benny was asking, do you, do you want to ask that, Peter, about um, Simon's subsequent cases? Where, was he still being guided by, um, I don't, well, whatever. Yeah, he yeah. Hi, Kenneth. It's, just... it's Peter here. Um, I get that he, he won his case um, on the basis of this spiritual experience, what I'm wondering is, was his entire subsequent successful legal career based on every time he had a difficult case, he went up to his attic and set up the altar and waited for the answer to come to him? Or it's was, it based, shrewd, on, or was very, it based on his legal capabilities? I think it was his legal capabilities. It's a very shrewd question, Peter. And I, I have to admit, I don't know the answer, but from I know that his, his experiences went on for about 18 months. Um, and then stopped. And his career certainly prospered for another 20 or 30 years after that, uh, to our certain knowledge. So I, I, I suspect it was his reputation, which of course is half the battle at least, plus the fact that he was no doubt a very competent lawyer. Um, but it goes back to the question that was asked a few minutes ago about what was the causal link between the experiences and his his winning the case, and, and we, we just don't know. Um, the only thing I would say is that people working in this field, and I'm thinking here of Mike Jackson's work, Mike was at the time a DPhil student with Gordon Claridge, who was in Oxford as an, a, a psychologist working in on psychotic experiences. And Gordon was very interested in the way that psychotic experiences could have a creative effect on people. Uh, that he had a lot of stories of, 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 of major breakthroughs being linked to people having dreams or other kinds of psychotic experience. So the British Psychological Society a few years ago published a platform statement about psychotic experiences saying that we should understand them as part of the creative process that can sometimes go badly wrong and that's when you may have a schizophrenic illness or something of that sort, but they're a faculty that we all have to a greater or lesser extent, and that it goes with our faculty for creativity. Now, I don't want to romanticize this, and remember we the other side to the coin is that Simon, if he'd been our patient in the early days, we'd have been having to monitor him very carefully to make sure he hadn't got a brain tumor that was gonna 
need intervention. So it, it, it just adds an extra dimension to our diagnosis. And it's part of what makes psychiatry so challenging is that we see the unusual and atypical cases and we, we have these very differential diagnoses to make. And what this slide is meant to highlight is that the challenges we face are not only challenges about the facts of the case, but how we evaluate those facts. It brings value judgments right into the heart of psychiatric diagnosis. And notice that this is right at the heart of the DSM. It's not an external critique of psychiatry. This is the DSM's own wording. And in the DSM's own wording, there are values written right into the heart of the diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, Bill, that, that's about the halfway point. So I don't well, let me, want... I, I think if, if if I could just show where that leads you and then, then we, we do, do you want to break halfway through or do you want to carry on? No, I th we're, we're used to carrying on. Right, right. well, let this. me show you. So um, the values are there. Uh, this is our colleague in the States, John Sadler, who um, is the current editor of PPP and was co-editor when we established the journal. And John's done a fascinating piece of work on the DSM. He's an American psychiatrist uh, showing that values run right through the whole document. Um, he, he did it as a piece of ordinary language philosophy. I've done something similar with the ICD. ICD, the values are there. They're just more deeply hidden. They're transparent in the DSM. And if you want to read more about this, John's book, Values and Psychiatric Diagnosis, is a wonderful example of ordinary language philosophy in action. Um, that's, the, uh, that's just the reference. So that does bring us to part two, which is if <clears> we <throat> accept, and I, 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 I'm hoping I'm not riding roughshod over questions people have got, but if we accept that the values are there, they're in the heart of psychiatric diagnosis. What does that mean? I'm going to look at three interpretations of what it means. That will then bring us to values-based practice. Um, I'm then going to look at the links between values-based practice and evidence-based practice. That will lead us into a few words about the wider field of values-based medicine. And then I want to touch on a case that was in our Supreme UK Supreme Court but was actually a Scottish case, the Montgomery ruling. Does that ring bells for people? I'm getting some nods, that's great. I have to confess, I wasn't aware of the case. <laughs> right, well, I'll, I'll come to Montgomery because it's one that in, in philosophy and psychiatry we need to know about. So three interpretations. Values are there, what do they mean? Does Thomas Saz still ring bells for people? Yes. Yes. So professor of psychiatry at Syracuse University, made his living out of his mantra, mental illness is a myth. And what he meant by that was that mental illness is about values. Real illness, proper diseases, are about facts. Now, that's the essence of what Thomas Sass said. I don't want to suggest that he was, you know, just pushing a line on this. He had a very well-developed argument he was a very clever man. I was fortunate to have met him two or three times. And I built on his work in my own critique of that approach. And he was a very generous opponent. And uh, nonetheless, his position essentially was that the values are there in psychiatry. They're not there in physical medicine. And that means that mental illness is not a genuine illness. It's more about ethics, law, communication, it's, it's a, a life problem, not an, not an illness. Now, opposed to SARS was a, somebody I hope you will be still familiar with, although he's also now died, Bob Kendall, Robert Kendall. Uh, he was medical officer of health for Scotland, I think, wasn't he, in its one stage? Yeah, chief medical officer. And, 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 and a former um, president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Yeah. He was a superb epidemiologist, and he was also a very good philosopher of science. And he wrote a still very valuable book on the philosophy of science as it applies to psychiatric diagnosis. And Bob Kendall used his inaugural uh, address as professor of psychiatry, I think at Edinburgh, wasn't he? Um, to, to oppose Thomas Saz. So he didn't 
choose to talk about his epidemiological work. He talked about SARS and Bob Kendall's argument was that, yes, the values are there in psychiatry, but one day we'll have enough science so that the values will evaporate. They won't be there anymore. They won't be needed. Now, again, I can't do justice to Bob's position, but he was another person with whom I disagreed as a young and rather cheeky psychiatrist. <laughs> and he was all, another very generous in supporting me and uh, had a very well-developed argument. I never managed to shift him from it, uh, but his argument essentially was that once we had enough science, the values will disappear. I'm going to show you, I hope, by the end of the presentation that once the more science we get, the more the values are going to come into play in the whole of medicine, not just in psychiatry. So here is Austin's take. And without justifying it, I'm going to suggest that we should see a line of descent from Austin through Hare. This, this, uh, Hare was Austin's successor as, as, as uh, White's professor in Oxford. And uh, he worked, he used ordinary language philosophy to look specifically at the language of values. And um, what Hare, Hare's work is quite abstract, but it's got lots of very useful pointers for us in medicine and psychiatry. And this is the pointer I want to take for today. Um, his conclusion was that values are often present, but invisible, and they become visible, they become explicit, because they, where they cause trouble. So where there are di differences and diversity of values, we call this sometimes the squeaky wheel principle. If the values are causing trouble, if people are disagreeing about them, they become visible. And so long as everybody agrees about them, you don't notice them. And, and then it's extending the metaphor. It's a bit like the wheel that isn't squeaking. You don't notice it when your car's driving along and you're stuck in a traffic jam in, in West, West Glasgow. But uh, my goodness, you wouldn't get far without the wheels. So explicit values, if you take Hare's line on this, explicit, what we see in psychiatry is values that become explicit because the areas of which we, the areas in which we work in psychiatry are areas where there is a wide diversity of human values. Now, let's see how different that is from what either Sars or Kendall was, were arguing. Uh, it's saying that the values are there in bodily medicine as they are in psychiatry. It's, there's not a difference of kind, as Sars has suggested. But we don't notice them in bodily medicine because, by and large, they're shared values. Um, so to take one example, uh, if you have a severe pain in the center of your chest running down your left arm, uh, there won't be an argument about are you in a bad condition because we know from everything we've learned about the heart that this is a sign your heart isn't functioning properly. But notice that that word functioning properly demands value judgments, as does functioning properly in Simon's case, but the values are shared. Any one of us, our heart function is the same. What counts as good or bad heart function is the same. So for that and similar reasons, we don't notice the values in areas like cardiology. There's no criterion B in cardiology because the values aren't causing trouble. But think of what we deal with in psychiatry, emotion, belief, sexuality, identity. These are areas where human values are highly diverse. And the one result of that is that the values become highly material to how we understand psychiatric disorders. Think St. Paul again, the difference between St. Paul and someone with a schizophrenic illness. The values are right there at the heart of how we understand psychiatric disorders. And so they become explicit. And so we have to have a criterion B to try and marshal and use them in a way that's appropriate. I will pause there just for a second, Ian, to see if there's any, this is the nub of the philosophy that's driving values-based practice. It's a nice comment um, from Gordon. Um, yeah, uh, do you want to read it out, Gordon, or? Uh, um, yeah, which one is that? The last one, the, I, uh, the neuroscience, yeah. 
Yeah, just um, what um, what Bill was saying just lines up very much with the fact, you know, that those two domains and how they relate to each other, all the, the, the amazing understanding we have in neuroscience actually underlines that there's room for the mind and makes the mystery greater in a sense. Yeah. Well, I, I'd, I'd, I'd want to agree with you, Gordon, and I think you're taking us in the direction where I hope this whole presentation will go. This isn't undermining science it's actually something that we need because of the success of the science and as you rightly say i mean people like philip corollas working i mentioned earlier working in semantic logic and with cognitive scientists and psychologists that, that, that these are people who don't um don't dismiss the mind you know they don't say oh we know enough about the brains so and now we don't need to worry about the mind quite the opposite those are the people who are taking the mind really seriously <laughs> and i hope i hope it's the same with values we take values seriously because we're good solid scientifically trained medics rather than because we're somehow wanting to walk around or walk away from evidence-based medicine but there's another comment from Dave Johnson. Are you are you able to speak to us, Dave? Or, or I can read that. I'm out. here. Yeah. Oh yeah, Dave, you're you're the the the, the functional disorders. Do you want to say something? Um, I, I think it's really interesting hearing about the um contrast with physical illnesses, because I've thought for a long time that the other specialties in medicine are actually very similar in terms of mental health but for some reason within mental health there's a mm, a challenge that psychiatrists are, are met with and the other specialties often have investigations that they can do to try and help support a diagnosis within mental health it's a um you know, it's, it's an interview and listening to a story and then coming to a, a conclusion. And you may use investigations, but that would be to exclude a physical illness. Um, and, you know, in, increasingly we, we hear people, particularly neurology was what I was thinking of. I, I think the last estimate I heard was 40% of the people in neurology clinics were not presenting with organic pathology it, it was something functional yeah. um and I, I think the approach to that was different in different parts of the uk some neurology clinics were thinking well that's something that's our core business we'll try and do something about it other clinics were saying well we're we're not going to touch that because it's more complicated and we don't know what we're, we're doing we're, but we're, thinking we'll about pass, it, that, pass it to the psychiatrists yes. yeah. <laughs> But thinking about values as a way to explain that uh, around the emotions and things that psychiatrists may, may deal with is, uh, I find that really fascinating. So thank yeah. you. Well, th thank you. Yes, I think I'm thinking when you were saying that, I was thinking of Nancy Andreessen, you know, the ex editor of the American Journal of Psychiatry and a very big wheel in American neuroscience. And she's, since she retired, she's been going around. around doing lectures in different parts of America with the title, Why I Am Proud to Be a Psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And what she's saying essentially is what, what you've just said, that it's the last area of medicine where we have no option but to deal with real people. Mm -hmm. There's no bit of the body, no bit of the brain that we can, we can substitute for the patient. It's dealing with the patient. And I think that's, that's absolutely, you're absolutely right. That's part of the challenge. And it's part of where I think this is leading us. Can I um, bring, bring in one more person before we move on? Leone, yeah, I'd like that comment. Do you want to read it out? Or, uh... <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. First of all, for, I was one of the um, small group of um, psychiatrists in Aberdeen a long time ago when um, we had that conference. So it's very nice to <laughs> see you again. <laughs> I was making a comment about a therapy called CAT, or Cognitive Analytic Therapy, yes, which um, was founded in the 60s, 70s by Anthony Ryle, a nephew of Gilbert Ryle. And from his therapy, I would say he was pretty influenced by common language, um, ordinary language philosophy, because mm. it seems to me that those values come through in how we 
have a frame for therapy, but we treat, uh, collaborate with each patient with their individual story. So there's no yes. one, one size. Well, that's, that, I'm very grateful to you for that, Leonie, because I, I, I didn't, I wasn't aware that cognitive analytic therapy had that connection with ordinary language philosophy. And it's a wonderful link. Thank you very much through the Riles. Yes. <laughs> Well, shall we press on a little bit? Because I'm Please, conscious yeah, that yeah. conscious we've got to eight o'clock, and it's uh, yeah, we've got to see where we can get with the story. So um, that brings us to values-based practice. Through this was a book that my first book in the field where I literally took ideas from R. M. Hare and applied them to the language of medicine. Um, and the book covers quite a lot more than the way values come into our concepts of disorder, but out of that came a values-based practice via a particular way of thinking about values. Um, Ian, we really don't have time to do any exercises on this, but the bottom line is that in medicine, we've come increasingly to identify values with ethics. Uh, this is not about ethics, it's about a much wider range of, uh, of saliences. And we can think of values as being individually diverse, and covering anything that matters or is important. I'm sorry, I've put the or in twice there, but anything that matters or is important to us individually. Anything that matters or is important. So it's a very wide range of, 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 of things that, that, that are relevant here. Um, and it's, it's that that underpins what's now become known as values-based practice. Um, values-based practice is one of a number of resources we have for working with values in medicine. Ethics is, of course, a very important resource, but so are also these other disciplines. And if you think of values-based practice as part of a toolbox, and what it's bringing to the toolbox is a resource that will help us to work with the individuality and diversity of our values as unique individuals, specifically in the context of healthcare, although interestingly, people are starting to develop similar ideas in other fields. Now, you should have the handout in which I summarize the key elements of values-based practice, um, but this is a, a diagram of the process, and you can see that down the left-hand side are a number of process elements, and they together help you to come to a balanced decision within frameworks of shared values. So this is not a, not a, a process that gives you answers, it's a process that helps you find answers for yourself in the particular situation in which you find yourself. Leone, I'm wondering how far this rings bells with cognitive analytic therapy. I suspect it's got some parallels, hasn't it? Um, yes, it, it is about um, being truly collaborative in a real relationship um, together. And that's difficult for medics to do, I think. Um, um, so um, certainly coming from psychiatry into uh, therapy, I had to divest myself of lots of roles really and, mm -hmm. and be ordinary and uh, yes. Yeah, so I'm sorry if I'm not making much sense here, but um, I'm just reading. Well, I, I was broadly thinking, Lenny, about the fact that the cognitive analytic therapy provides you with a, a, a structured process for working through problems with an individual rather than saying to you, this is the answer and we're going to prescribe you this medication. Well, that, yeah, I was trying to say that. And it, yes, exactly, that's right. Yeah. So it is truly collaborative in the sense that you're two real people together. Yes. Um, it's it's um, equal, but it's a metric. So um, what I say to patients, I've got a little, a bit of knowledge about a therapy. You've got the story of your life. So let's put them yes. together and see what we come up with. But it's authentic rather than a, a sort of, um, play at it <laughs> yes well i think you'll see when we talk about montgomery that the links are really very close there so if you want more information about values-based practice there's stuff on the handout and then a lot more on the actual website Bill, can um, I, uh, yes uh, sorry what does jumping out at me decential intrigue well I, <laughs> I i'm glad you <laughs> glad you spotted that <laughs> the census is is a slightly long-winded thing to explain but if you think of, we normally work on a consensual basis, but you need also all to come to the same idea. And when we're developing frameworks of shared values, that's very much how we work. We're looking for a consensus around of the values that we share. 
dissensus says that when we make individual decisions, we balance those values in a particular way, but we're not getting rid of one or other set of values. They're still there in the frame. And the next day for the next decision, we might balance them differently. So it's a dissensual process as opposed to a consensual process. And both of them are part of the process that helps us to come to these balanced decisions. That, that's very useful. Thank, thanks for defining it. Thank you. Uh, it is defined in the handout, so briefly. Very good. So this is where the centre is. Uh, this is St Catherine's College. Um, the centre itself is a virtual centre, so I'm afraid we can't really claim any of these buildings, but it's very nice to be in, in, in such an environment. Um, we've had a now six years of working with a focus on education. This is a training template that we developed in the early days. And this is called a faculty handbook, but in fact, it was developed by the surgical team, the Nuffield Department of Surgical Sciences. And the current director of the center has just taken over from me is Ashok Hander, who is the tutor for surgery in Oxford. So it's anticipating that this exciting development from mental health into bodily medicine. But we're working within a whole system approach, and these are the main areas of work that we've been involved with, education and training, regulation and guidance. We've uh, been working particularly with NICE, and if you look at any NICE guidance, you'll find that the uh, information about how you should be using the guidance has been updated, and it's been updated to say you need to take into account values. Uh, Although NICE have been um, NICE have been saying this for some years, uh, and it is a point that's now been built into the Montgomery judgment that I'll come back to. But I think we've had a real impact there. Then integration and teamwork. Um, we've had quite a bit of research going on in the way that values come into the way we work together as teams. I can't say it's resulted in the same headline results as both education and training regulation guidance. I think long term, it might be a very important area of work. And notice that the whole three way structure is set between theory and practice. And one of the things that we've been able to hold on to is that in developing these very practical outcomes, we've retained a very strong focus on theory. And we have a whole theory network within the center that's led by uh, a uh, Scandinavian philosopher Young, well, youngish Scandinavian philosopher, Anna Bergqvist, um, who works also in Manchester and Oxford. And Anna is uh, one of the few younger philosophers in the world working in analytic moral theory. So she's an ideal person to be doing this work, but she's leading this very important and vigorous strand of theory. So how does this connect with evidence-based practice? Um, now we were, we're going to do it. Has, has anybody had a chance to do this second exercise? I think, we, could, you, could you put into the... Yes, yes, yes. So the exercise, for those who haven't looked at it, is it's a forced choice exercise. You've got to imagine that you've got the early symptoms of a fatal disease. You've got two treatments. One guarantees you a cure, but it might also kill you. The other gives you, sorry, the other gives you a guaranteed period of remission but no final cure. The other guarantees you either a cure or it'll kill you outright. And you have to say, how long would you want your period of remission to be to choose treatment A rather than going for treatment B? Um, and the instructions I hope should have said, think about this from your own point of view. Don't think about it as a general problem and write down your figure. Did anybody write down a figure and are they prepared to put it into chat? Yeah, yeah. What figures have we got in? Well, I, I went with five years, but I was hoping I could still have um, have uh, treatment B at the end of my five no, years. No, you can't. This, I'm, afraid, <laughs> I'm afraid that doesn't work. <laughs> Do we have any other numbers in the in the chat? So, Leone, a year. Um, Peter, one day. <laughs> yes, no, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Any other figures? Um, 25 years. Yeah. Why, yep. why not? Be, uh, yeah. So you get the message. If we were doing this with a live audience, I'd be writing these figures up. And yeah. what, what you'd get is 
a wide range of figures. I'm very impressed that even on video, we're getting the same wide range of figures. Oh, and um, I'll show you some other figures in a moment. But you get a very wide range. And then the second part of the exercise is to write down your reasons for your choice. Did anybody write down it? Um, was it Peter who wrote down one day? What did you have in mind, Peter? Uh, I've just I've just typed it in actually. It says Peter here, but the the, yes. the gist of it is we're we're told that um, this illness is potentially fatal, whereas treatment B is fatal in fifty percent of cases straight away. It's kill or cure. Yes. You take treatment B, there's a one in two chance you're going to die. Treatment A being potentially fatal, you've not given us the odds, but I'd take my chances on potentially fatal right. being a better bet than go ahead, there's a half, there's a 50 50 chance you're going to die tomorrow. Very good. Every time. What about the person who said 25 years? What was your thinking? Gordon. Yeah. Was it Gordon? I think it was Gordon, yeah. Or Dave, Dave, Dave said 20 years, yeah. 20 years. Well, somebody who said a long period, what was your thinking? Uh, I thought that during that period, they'd be likely to improve treatments anyway. Um, and that i would take my chances with that. Very good. Any other reasons people came up with? Uh, we only one day time to find a cure. See all the I, I wasn't thinking about medicine. I was thinking about <laughs> having time <laughs> to adjust. Um, I thought romantically I would see the season through once more and say goodbye. <laughs> okay, very good. So we're all we're all coming up with rather different things. What 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 unifies everything that people are talking about? Would you say? Values, what, what we value or what, you know. Yes, I think it, it's what's, what matters or is important to us. Would that be fair? Yeah. Um, and it, the, the, so here's a distribution from the very first time we did this exercise. This is with a group of surgeons, um, nurses, medical students. Uh, and you can see we got a very wide range, wider than we've had this evening, but uh, it, 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 it's consistent when we do this now four times a year with groups of medical students, all of whom are a similar age. They're about equally split between men and women. And we consistently get this very wide range of responses. And then we go into the reasons and we get, as we have this evening, individually highly specific sets of reasons. And as Ian's already identified, it, it takes a bit longer to get this out if we do it as a proper Q&A. But what we're all talking about is what matters or is important to us. This is what is, these are our reasons. This is what turns into our reasons. So we have um, we have uh, uh, reasons are about values, uh, things that matter are important to us individually. And the bottom line of this exercise is that you all have the same evidence base for your decision. Admittedly, with the shrewd characters we've got this evening, you were able to dig holes in the evidence base. But that's what happens in real life, of course. The evidence base is never certain. Um, but you've got the same evidence, but you bring to that evidence different values, individual values, and you get very different decisions. Is that fair? Yep. So rather like the Simon story, what we've done here is to show that whilst the evidence is crucial and irreducible, it's not sufficient to get you to a decision. To get you to a decision, that's right for the individual, you also have to look at what's important to them, their values. So that's how values-based medicine and evidence-based medicine stick together, if you like. And it's because of that, that the recent developments in the field have been very much in medicine. Uh, indeed, I have to say in Oxford, the Department of Psychiatry are not terribly interested in this. It's the Nuffield Department of Surgical Sciences where all the actions taken place. And subsequently in areas like uh, emergency medicine uh, and um, radiography and radiology. So we're seeing a very strong development in lots of areas of, uh, of, of bodily medicine. And why would this be? Why do you think scientific advances are leading to people taking 
the values in their field more seriously, the values of their individual patients more seriously. I think we have time for just one final opportunity for people to ask questions or to suggest answers rather. Why do you think scientific medicine, you can see why scientific medicine might drive the need for evidence-based practice. Why does it drive the need for values-based practice? But there's a nice comment from Peter Benny. Why, why, like, Peter, can you say the, the what what doctors tend to do when they're ill? <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's kind of a, a core component of the um, the realistic medicine concept that was pushed by our late lamented chief medical officer, who tragically uh, had to give up her post when she made an unfortunate choice about where to travel during COVID. But right. um, she, a, a, a core of her, her views that she was trying to put across was how essential it is to allow a patient to make a decision about a potential treatment by taking into account what would happen if I don't take this treatment, which we right. tend not, we've tended not to do traditionally yep. in medicine yep. and and often when you frame it in those terms which doctors tend to do for themselves when they're patients you find yourself in a position where far from taking the the treatment that might cure you but equally might kill you you go with the situation of well actually i won't have that heroic treatment i'll have something considerably more conservative and yes. i think we we see this we see this played out in the the debates about euthanasia and assisted suicide as well so what that thought process is doing is allowing you to access and make sense of what's important or matters to you peter would you agree so that's a very nice way of putting it. And I think the, the other message I take from that way of putting it is that it's about choice. So values-based medicine is driven by scientific advances, essentially because the impact of scientific advances is to open up new choices for us, and with choices go values. So Peter, taking your point, one of the big choices is, do I take this evidence-based treatment or do I not? But it's quite likely there will be, and you said, oh, will I go for some more conservative approach? And it's because you have those choices that your values become important. It, it, you know, going back 50 years when I was a medical student, there were many areas where there was really no choice whatsoever. And you, you, uh, except, to, except that you were gonna die from the disease and you'd rather have the disease and die from it than, but now, in most areas, we have a number of choices. Think of the vaccines for COVID. I mean, the arguments going on about, you know, one in one in a half a million risk, and it's still driving people's choices, understandably. But it's the choices and the way choices are opened up by scientific advances that brings values right into the heart of decision making. Um, it, it was always there in principle. But the choices are what make those values, as in the example you've given us, Peter, much more difficult. And remember, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Where the values are rubbing together and causing trouble, they become explicit. And this is very much what we've been seeing in surgical sciences, and it's what we're increasingly seeing in the rest of medicine. Um, this is just an example of an area of scientific medicine where scientific advances have demonstrably raised all the issues around values, genomic medicine. Um, fertility treatments are another area. I've never worked in that field, but people who have tell me that the real challenges in a fertility clinic are not to do with the science, it's to do with the emotional impact of the decisions that couples have to make in, in undertaking fertility treatment. So the science has meant that emotion, desire, volition, sexuality, identity, all those issues that we deal with in psychiatry by the nature of the conditions that we see are suddenly now there in the fertility clinic in the way that they weren't a few years ago. So science, contrary to one of my heroes, Bob Kendall, used to, thinking that one day we'd have enough science, we wouldn't need the values. Quite the opposite, the more science we get, the more choices we have and the more our values and hence values-based practice are going to come into play. So we're back to this strong model of partnership between evidence-based medicine and values-based medicine. 
uh, we need the evidence, but we also need the values and we need to bring them together. And that's important because it means that we have an effective way of beginning to link science with people. I think, Peter, again, this speaks to your nice story about what we do as doctors isn't what we let our patients do. And we should, you know, you need to reflect, what if I don't take this treatment? Well, we need to link the science much more carefully with individual people. So we're not the first to say this. Um, interestingly, this, uh, if any of you be, have read anything in evidence-based medicine, this is a, one of the foundation volumes for the field of evidence-based medicine. See, the first author was David Sackett, and he wrote this book when he was the first director of the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine in Oxford. And in, in the start of the book, he defines evidence-based medicine as bringing together best research evidence, which is really what evidence-based medicine has become, but bringing that together with experience of the experience of clinicians, clinical experience, and note patients' values. By patient values, we mean the unique preferences, concerns, and expectations each patient brings to a clinical encounter, which must be integrated into clinical decisions if they are to serve the patient. I mentioned NICE earlier. This is an extract from the, um, the, 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 uh, guide, the, 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 the prologue to any of the guidelines, which tells you how to use the guidelines. When ex exercising their judgment, Professionals are expected to take this guideline fully into account alongside the individual needs, preferences, and values of their patients or service users. So values are there in the best of evidence-based medicine. Yes, the field has become rather debased in many areas as though all we need to make decisions is to look at the evidence. We certainly need evidence-based medicine, but evidence-based medicine encompasses and requires at its best values-based medicine alongside it as a partner. This is why we're seeing values-based practice developing so strongly in surgical care in an area like Oxford. What about Montgomery, which I've mentioned a couple of times? Well, this is a Supreme Court decision from 2015. And although it wasn't about consent, it has implications for consent. Uh, and that this is the actual, you see, it was, it was based, it was based on a Scottish case, and it was a case, I won't go through the details, but it was essentially about caesarean section. It wasn't a psychiatric case at all. And the nub of the case was that the gynecologist who was acknowledged and everybody accepted was a very good and caring gynecologist. She took it upon herself not to tell patients with a diabetes, as this Mrs. Montgomery had, that there was a risk of their child developing difficulties in ordinary vaginal delivery, because her experience was that when she mentioned that, her patients automatically said, oh, I'd like a cesarean section. And she, the gynecologist, considered that the risks of cesarean section were greater than the risks of vaginal delivery, even in these cases. Well, essentially what it came down to is that the, the lower courts had all agreed with the uh, gynecologist that it was the gynecologist's decision and she'd done the right thing by not mentioning it to Nadine Montgomery, the patient. The Supreme Court said, I'm afraid that's not good enough. And they took evidence from the GMC and others and said, contemporary standards of medicine require that there is a dialogue between the clinician and patient. And that dialogue should get the clinician to the point where there is sufficient understanding of the risks and benefits note of the options available to make a choice that takes into account the patient's values. Now it's a carefully, it, the, I've, I've summarized it there, but the actual, the actual judgment, it's about 125 clauses. It's interesting, it's worth reading because unlike most of these long legal cases, it's incre incredibly well constructed and it's very clinical in its orientation. And the essence of it is that it's saying, when we make decisions, we, we as clinicians have to be in dialogue with our patients. We are bringing to it a knowledge of the sensible options available. They talk about evidence-based options available, but the choice between options has to take into account what really matters to the individual patient. And what they said with the 
the uh, index case, the Montgomery case, was that because there'd been no dialogue with Mrs. Montgomery, there was no way they could take into account Mrs. Montgomery's views. And Mrs. Montgomery, if she'd chosen to have a cesarean section because she would rather take the risk to herself than to allow that to go forward, that could have made a difference to the case. So the, the basis of consent now is that we have to enter into a dialogue based on what we know about the reasonable options, the evidence-based options, but the dialogue has to get us to the point where we can understand what's the right option as judged by the values of the individual patient. So, Ian, it's something that's worth knowing about in medicine. Yes. And of course, it's infinitely harder to do all this in psychiatry, but nonetheless, that's what is required of us. And it, it's in the new, it's in the GMC guidance, it's in good psychiatric practice. Uh, it's most clear and explicitly stated in the Montgomery judgment itself. So okay. Montgomery is about shared decision making based on evidence and values. It's about this model of bringing together evidence-based practice and values-based practice. So if I have a minute or two just to draw some conclusions, sure. we've been talking about ordinary language philosophy into practice guided by another of my heroes, JL Austin. Uh, in the first section, we looked at, we did a bit of Austinian fieldwork, looking at uh, a psychiatric case, the story of Simon. And that produced a more complete picture of what's going on in psychiatric diagnosis, showing that as, as judged by the language of the DSM itself, values are integral to the may, way we make diagnoses in psychiatry. Um, the second half built on that more complete view um, with the skills-based process for working with diverse values as values-based practice, which we took from RM Hare, who was a pupil of Austin's. Um, we, we looked at how values-based practice fits together with evidence-based practice. Um, we've seen how that's above all important in scientific medicine because of the way that choices are opened up by science and technological advances. And we've seen how that's recently been uh, codified in the Supreme Court Mon 2015 Montgomery ruling. Um, I want to finish on a slightly different point. I think somebody mentioned Star Trek earlier. Uh, it, it, it happens that the Patrick Stewart, who plays Jean-Luc Picard in this picture in the middle, is an ex-fellow of, uh, of St. Catherine's College. Uh, we have a, a visiting fellowship in, for dramatic, for essentially in, in theatre. And uh, Patrick Stewart was one of those fellow visiting professors and continues as a, it's a lucky coincidence for me because I'm a, I'm a Trekkie, I have to admit that I love Star Trek. And, and the, the, the point of this image is that all the faces on this image are much younger than me. And they represent a very diverse group. I've mentioned Anna Bergfist, who's um, on my screen, bottom right, um, and I mentioned Ashok Hander, who's the top of the screen. He's the surgeon who now directs the center. But, uh, and I mentioned Philip Corliss, who's just above Anna on the right there and is doing the work in semantic logic. But notice that they're a very diverse group uh, and they're all young and they are the next generation. I think that's a very exciting development because what we're seeing is a field that started from uh, analytic philosophy, ordinary language philosophy in particular, is now building in a number of other areas, phenomenological uh, philosophy, African philosophy, logic and semantic logic, and the cognitive sciences. And this is the last word that I want to leave you with from Austin. Austin had a pre-PC phrase about, in philosophy, it's often the negative concept that wears the trousers. And what he meant by that, and this is why it's pre-PC, was that it's sometimes he, he meant that it's the man who wears the trousers, as it were, and, and decides what happens. What he meant was that it's often where our concepts break down that we learn most about what they really mean. Psychiatry has been dogged in the 20th century by difficulties that are about as much about defining mental illness as the, the practice of the field, which is complicated and challenging at many levels. And I think we can take from Austin the idea that um, at least in the area of values, psychiatry has been leading the field and the negative concept in this case, psychiatry has very much been 
wearing the trousers. Why is this? Because remember, science drives values. Psychiatry and mental health in general, they're not properly understood trailing behind cardiology and gastroenterology. We're doing the most difficult area of science. The brain, after all, is the most difficult organ to study. So it's a combination of the challenges of the most difficult science, the challenge of the most difficult areas of values, and the challenge of working with, as uh, I think, Leonie, you put it for us earlier, it's, it's working with real people that, that actually matters here. So mental health is leading the way in linking science with people, and it's the next generation who are going to take us there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. That was, that was brilliant. Thank you.